the book of Colossians, and it's not a uh, it's not a long book by any stretch of the imagination. And once again, there's many who are here today who haven't been here. So let me just a brief recap. Um, and I've got something is moving on my screen that I really wish would not be there. You can't see it, but I can, and it's, okay, good. I was able to move it. It's irritating me. Um, Colossians is one of the books that Paul wrote while he was in prison. And in fact, Colossians is one that Paul had never actually been there. Colossians was started uh, as a church by Epaphras, who was, a, uh, I guess, a disciple of Paul. And so, they have their own struggles. Now, Paul tells us and commends, commends the church at Colossae um, for their believing and understanding God's grace. They understand God's grace, but they have some other problems that Paul is, is, is dealing with, with them. And, come on. I don't know what's going on. It's not done this to me before. Sorry. Got this little deal and it moves and it blocks my stuff. So bear with me if all of a sudden I seem like I've gotten an ADD moment and I've just kind of gone down somewhere else. So before... Okay. Covered that. Cool. So Paul was excited for them. And you read that in the introduction. In, in chapter 1, which we covered several weeks ago. That they had an understanding of God's grace. However, it got back to Paul that while they understood the grace of God, they had some other issues that needed to be dealt with. One of which was the preeminence of Christ. Which Paul elaborated on in verses 13 to 18. Paul also wanted them to understand that it was because of who Jesus was and what he did, that they were able to be reconciled back to God. That is, that their debts had been paid in full, and the relationship with the Father had been restored through Christ. Verses 19 through 23. Which brings us to the passage we'll be looking at today. Verses 24 through 29. And in this passage, Paul talks about his role and the responsibility as one who has been, excuse me, who has been re reconciled back to God through Jesus Christ. And once you've been reconciled, you are now, not only are you a child of God, but you are a minister of the gospel. He does this in a way that might be considered unconventional. He starts off by talking about rejoicing in suffering. And he's rejoicing in his suffering for their sake. And he's also talking about rejoicing for the church in general. This isn't exactly what most people would lead off with when giving a pep talk. Paul then reveals that he is merely a steward of the ministry that God gave him to preach the word of God and reveal the mystery of the gospel to Jews and Gentiles alike. Paul states that, in, that his ministry is not only to proclaim the gospel, but also to teach with all wisdom and to present so that he can present every man complete in Christ through the power of Christ in him. So now that I've kind of got you caught up and we've taken a closer look at where we're going today, um, I'll give you uh, what we're, I'll, I'll give you some highlights of what we're going to touch on. So in today's sermon, we're going to be looking at what Paul means when he talks about what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. That could be a confusing and mis interpreted phrase what is meant excuse me what is meant by the stewardship of ministry 
the ministry, excuse me, the mystery, the mystery, which is, was hidden in the past, and finally the purpose of ministry. So we're going to cover four things today. So what does Paul mean in verse 24 when he mentions that there is indeed, excuse me, a need to fill up what is lacking in Christ's sufferings? Well, let me go back and let's take a look at the text. Uh, I'm sorry, I hope you can read that. If not, you can open your Bibles or electronic devices to the passage there that we're going to uh, be dis discussing. And he says, in verse 24, he says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh. Remember, he's in prison because of the gospel. He's unjustly in prison because of the gospel, but nevertheless, he is in prison because of the gospel. I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. So is Paul saying here to the church at Colossae that Christ didn't suffer enough? That what Christ did on the cross was not enough for salvation? No. That's not what Paul is saying at all. Boom. The cross was enough. In John 19.30, Jesus said, It is finished. His work. His reconciliation between God and man was done. Colossians, if we go back, in chapter 1, verses 12 through 14, in that passage, Paul says, We are rescued, we are redeemed, and we are forgiven. So, when Paul says he's filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions, he's not saying that Christ was somehow deficient. He, Paul is not talking... Oh, come on. Paul is not talking about suffering but service. And that Paul is actually talking about suffering while serving, suffering in service. A lot of times we hear people who preach the gospel, and there is truth in this, that when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, your life will change, and it will change for the better. Because no longer will you be burdened by the guilt of sin. No longer will you be burdened by the shame of sin. No longer will you be estranged from your Heavenly Father. But yet, Jesus paints... But the, let me back up one step here. But that is not the whole painting. Jesus also paints us a portrait of suffering. Jesus tells us, He says, in this world you will have suffering. John 15, 20, 21. If Jesus suffered, you will suffer. We go on down. Suffering of the followers in these, in these passages, you Feel, please feel free to look them up. In Revelation 6, 9 through 11, it's the martyrs, those who have been martyred for the cause of Christ, who ask, when, Lord, when will, will, will you take care of this? And in Acts 9, 4, it talks about Paul. And God specifically is talking about Saul, who will now be later named Paul. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So when we as Christians are persecuted for the gospel's sake, Jesus is the one who's actually being persecuted. We are his body. 
And when you stub your toe in the middle of the night, it hurts and your brain tells you so. So Jesus Christ, as head of the church, knows when you hurt. He knows when you're suffering. He knows when you're being persecuted. And if we're being persecuted, He's being persecuted. He says so right there. Saul, why are you persecuting me? And what was Paul doing? Paul was on his way with letters of authority to go to Damascus and take Jewish converts who had converted to Christianity and bring them in for trial. Paul didn't set out, or Saul at this time, didn't set out to go persecute the man Jesus Christ. He went out to persecute his followers because he thought they were heretics. But Jesus says, says, Saul, you're persecuting me. You're not just... In fact, he doesn't even necessarily mention those that Paul is going to go and arrest. The persecution of Christians is the persecution of Christ. So it is not about, it is not about salvation. It is about service. And Paul is saying, I'm doing my best to serve in those areas that I see where service needs to be done. He is serving the church at Colossae by writing this letter. And he is serving that church by addressing problems and misconceptions that they have. But here's the thing. If we go back... One second here. He is called to serve. But not only is he, is, he, is he called to serve, if we go back to that, what does he say? The first six words? I re, well, first three. I rejoice. Now I rejoice in my sufferings. He doesn't look at this, at the, at this as being miserable. He's in chains. He's under house arrest. People have to come serve him. Perhaps we've all seen old westerns. And, and you've seen the prisoner locked up in jail and the, the, the sheriff's office or whatever has an agreement with the saloon or, or a restaurant or someplace of they would bring the prisoner their food. Well, we have to take a couple of steps back from that because in Roman times, if you wanted something better to eat, you better find somebody on the outside to bring you food because the Roman government surely wasn't going to do that. So Paul was completely dependent on God to supply all his needs. And you know, he was in the midst of his suffering. And make no mistake, Paul says he's suffering. It's not a picnic. There's some real pain going on. But he's doing it because he knows he's serving his Lord and Savior for the cause of the Gospel. Okay. Now, rejoicing in the fa face of suffering doesn't, doesn't, sound, doesn't sound good. I hate going to the dentist. I do not rejoice in going to the dentist. I do not rejoice when they stick the thing in the Novocaine because, to deaden the pain because I can still feel the needle moving around. It doesn't hurt, but I can feel it. I can feel when they're doing the stuff. I can feel the vibrations. 
and my heart rate and my blood pressure go up and I, I, I don't enjoy that. I don't enjoy when I have to go to the hospital because I've cut both of my thumbs or fingers and I have to get stitches. And I don't like, I didn't enjoy being mocked and teased because I went to church on Sabbath. And that I couldn't do sports because it required playing on sundown Friday night and, 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 and on Saturday. But what are those sufferings compared to what Paul has gone through? What are those sufferings compared to those who have been martyred for the cause of Christ? What are those sufferings compared to those who have been in prison for years? But we are called to rejoice. It's not an option. In fact, Jesus says there's a blessing. Blessed are you. You're blessed. Do you know that? That when you're persecuted for the cause of Christ, you're actually blessed? You're blessed when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of thing, kinds of evil against you because of me. That is Jesus Christ. Rejoice and be glad. Now we can go to plenty of Psalms that says rejoice and be glad and make a joyful noise and enter his gates and all those kind of things. And those are kind of happy images that we have. But here in verse 12 of, of, of Matthew 5, it says, Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. I say, wait a minute, what? Persecuted prophets? Well, we know that uh, Jeremiah was persecuted. There was a conspiracy on his life. And others as well. They were persecuted because they were mocked. They were not believed. So as we pick this up, and this is, so they went on their way from the presence of the council rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer the shame for His name. Who is this? This is Peter and John. Remember, they were they were falsely, they were told, don't preach anymore in the name of Jesus. They were imprisoned. And what were they doing? They were singing. They were rejoicing. And they basically hear, they just, this is just the last part of the passage, they pretty much told the council off. So you can tell us to not preach in the name of Jesus Christ, but we have to obey Jesus Christ. And they went off rejoicing that they were considered worthy to suffer, that their testimony was enough that the people around them knew that they followed Christ. Is our testimony, how we live our lives, is that enough that people around us would know that we follow Christ? Now that we've talked about what Paul was, was, was talking about, what is lacking, let's, we can move on to the idea of stewardship of ministry. You're saying, what? Stewardship? I've heard of stewardship. There's plenty of parables in the Bible about stewardship. What's this idea about stewardship of ministry? Well, In verse 25 here of this passage, it says, Of this church I was made, I want you to, now I'm using the New American Standard Bible, and it's a more literal translation. It says, Of this church was the church, the body of Christ. The body of Christ is the church of this body, of this church, 
I was made minister. He's not necessarily talking about the church at Colossae or Laodicea or any of these others. He's talking the church universal at this time. I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit. Okay, I want you to think about that. I was made by God according to the stewardship. What is the steward? Somebody who's in charge of something. We've heard the parable of the steward of the talents and of the uh, uh, minas. And you can go back and you can look them up. But that's the idea. The steward. Joseph was the steward of Pharaoh's household in the country. Joseph was in charge. He was a steward of Potiphar's household. Then he got promoted to second in command of all of Egypt. And in each case, Joseph was made the steward. Just as Paul says here, he was made the steward of his particular ministry. Because he says it's from God and it was bestowed on me for your behalf, for your benefit. So that I, Paul, might fully carry out the preaching of the Word of God. That was Paul's ministry, to preach the Word of God. Great, Paul can go ahead and preach that Word of God. But here's the thing. Everybody in here who has accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior is a steward of a ministry of one form or another. And it was given to you by God. To think about that. Nobody is, ex- is exempt. There are no bench warmers in God's economy. Paul was chosen. He says he was chosen from birth in Galatians 1.15. In Acts 9.15-16. And this is God talking He says, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. This is Paul's ministry. God is telling, revealing what Paul's ministry is. Paul's ministry is to go and bear his name before both the Gentiles, or well, not both, but the Gentiles, the kings, and the sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. That kind of makes my next question a little tenuous and scary for some of us. Have we asked God, what's our ministry? Lord, what's my ministry? What have you called me to do? Because while we might think some of this is glamorous, we don't like this last line. This is for I will show you how much you must suffer for my name's sake. And if you think we're exempt, ha <laughs> ha, we're not. And I can prove it. We are chosen to serve because we're all in the body. We're chosen to serve because in Romans 12, 6, gifts are given for the service of of the body. In 1 Corinthians 12.7 gifts, manifestations of the Spirit are given for service of the body. And in Ephesians 4 here that I have the giving of gifts and ministries to build up the body. And we could go to Ephesians 2, 9 and 10. We were saved by grace to do works that God has prepared for us in advance. No one is exempt from ministry. Your ministry will not look like my ministry. Not all of us are called to stand behind a pulpit. Not all of us are called to stand on a street corner and preach the gospel. But we are all called to love our neighbor. We are all called to forgive as God has forgiven us, 
And there is an expectation of using what God has given us. Those parables that I mentioned about stewards, there's some similarities and there's some differences. But one of the similarities in those two parables is resources were given. And the resources were given based on the individuals. Some were given five, some were two, some were one. There was an expectation that that resource was to be used. That those that invested and gained were rewarded. And those that didn't invest had it taken away. Those that didn't use it had it taken away. And the interesting thing in both of these parables that I'm referencing here, at the end, the king, the giver of the resources, says to the one who hid it, who wrapped it up, who was too afraid to use it, he said, you know what? If you would have just put it on deposit with the bankers and taken all the risk out of your hands and brought it to me with an increase, I'd have been much happier than I am with you now. Because there was an expectation that when, when the king or the landowner or whoever it was that gave those gifts, he says, I'm going to go away and here I want you to do this and I want you to make, produce an increase. Brothers and sisters, we're to produce an increase. Now we may not all see the harvest, because Scripture says one plants, one waters, another reaps the harvest. We all have a role to play. But if the seed doesn't get planted, there is no harvest. You eat it for the day and you're done. That's it. When it's gone, it's gone. There is no harvest. There is no increase. You plant the seed and you fail to water this is going to be a really scrawny harvest. We all want to be there to reap the harvest, perhaps. That was my favorite part of farming when we farmed, was the harvest. Because I got to see the fruits of all that hard work that we put in earlier. I moved irrigation pipe. You guys do it differently out here. I moved to irrigation pipe, and yes, I'm over six feet tall, but that corn would get eight, nine feet tall, or maybe ten feet tall, and you're trying to push it, and it's hot, and it, you're sweaty. And pollen season was sucked. I'm just going to put it plain and simple. Pollen season sucked, because you come out there, it's all sweaty, and you look yellow. Because you had all this corn pollen all over you. And you'd have cuts and scratches and itches where you didn't think you should have cuts and scratches and itches. And you'd be out traipsing at 7 o'clock in the morning and the corn's all wet and it's cold and you're just trying to not get wet and then you finally realize it's a futile attempt and you just, you do your job. But at the end when you could see the harvest and you knew all that time and effort that you put in was worth it. Here in God's economy, we might not see that harvest. We might not know, but there's a day coming. In the new Jerusalem, when we will know, when we will see, we'll be able to have those conversations. When people will come up to us and say, I'm so thankful that you, as the song would say, I'm so thankful that you gave to the Lord. What did I do? What did I do? I don't know. I'd, I'd... And he said, because you gave, missionary so-and-so was able to share the gospel with me. Because you gave, or because you, you picked me up, or you did this, you don't remember. My heart was prepared to hear the gospel. 
Because you did whatever it was you did. Because you prayed. I heard God's voice. And I didn't commit suicide. We won't know until we get there. Maybe we'll know now because we'll, we'll be able to talk to somebody and we'll be able to physically lead them to the Lord. But there's going to be a lot of them where we, where we won't really know how we had a hand involved in that. But you see, we're called to serve. We're called to use the gifts that God has given us to reach the lost and to build up the body. If you go to Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, and Ephesians 4, each of those passages talks about gifts. that are given they talk about the body and the building of the body up now each three passages has a little different focus but each one of them talks about those gifts being used and there is no gift that really is greater than any other gift paul goes to great lengths to 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 let his readers know that because the gifts that we might see he, as he points out, he says the parts of the body that aren't as glorified as, as others are given extra special recognition because they're covered up. They're treated valuable. So just because you don't think, well, I can never do that, don't dismiss what God has given you to use. Because remember, the same God that broke the fish and the bread and fed all the multitude is the same God that gave you the gifts. And He created you knowing what He wanted you to do. The mystery revealed. So, as we can see, God takes the idea of stewardship of ministry very seriously. So with that in mind, we can gain a better understanding of Paul's ministry to the Gentiles as we look more closely at the mystery. This mystery, which Paul was talking about. So what is the mystery? Well, if you'll follow along in verses 26 and 27... It says, that is the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to His saints. To His saints, those set apart. Those, con those converts, those Christian converts. To you and me, to whom God willed to make known what the riches of the glory of, his mystery, of this mystery among the Gentiles is, Especially to you and me. I'm not Jewish. Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Because see, you, you understand that before Christ died, there was always this idea that the Gentiles could be saved. They could be included in the, in, 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 with the Jews, the Hebrews, but they were really considered second class citizens. In the temple, there was only so far that they could go. They could only go, and I don't know exactly what it is, but there was only so far that the Gentiles could go. They didn't have the full rights of citizenship that Jewish men had. But see, when Christ died and the veil was torn, He also broke down that other barrier. We have equal access. We have equal value. We have equal worth. Christ in them, the Gentiles. And once again, uh, feel free to write these other Scriptures down and, and you can take a look at them later. It says, we proclaim Him, in verse 28, excuse me, The glory. So the mystery, and the other thing is, 
understand that there was some Gnosticism. And part of Gnosticism at that time is this secret knowledge. That's where um, we have to be careful with certain, um, like Masons and various other organizations that you, you come in here and you have to learn these things and we, we will show you this secret knowledge. And once you learn the secret knowledge, then you will be, become more spiritual and various other things. And we, we don't know, uh, they don't know if, if the reason Paul kind of highlighted this secret knowledge, if that was because they were wrestling with some Gnosticism or what it is. But Paul definitely wanted them to understand that as Gentiles, and we are all, if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. Okay, at that time. That you can be saved and you can have Christ in you. So as we've seen, the mystery that Paul was referring to is the fact that not only would the Gentiles be saved along with the Jews, they would also be equal in God's kingdom. Remember, Jesus says there's no longer Jew nor Gentile, or uh, Paul says that, Jew nor Gentile, Greek, uh, all these others, um, male or female type of a thing. In, in, in heaven, in God's kingdom, we're going to be the same. And that's weird to think about because we're used to having genders. We're used to having various classifications, various differences. The world is very good at dividing us up and sorting us and putting us into groups and various other classifications. In fact, our society today, the United States, is very good at dividing us up. We have white Americans, we have black Americans, we have Indian Americans, we have, or Native Americans, we have whatever, this American, Italian American, whatever it is. Instead of all being American, we're all divided up. In God's economy, there is no Gentile Christian. There is no Jewish Christian. You are either a son of God or you are not a son of God or daughter of God. Okay. You know, that we can, as we wrap this up, we're getting close. So we've seen, like I said, the mystery, God, that was the mystery. God revealed that, that every man was able to have Christ in them. And I want you to understand something, because part of the thing that Paul faced was the Judaizers. It was the, the Judaizers that partially led him to being in prison. Not completely, but partially. It was that mentality And this is important for them to know that they were on equal footing. You know, we at times because of where we are in hindsight, you know, is 2020. Sometimes it's hard for us to understand what it might be like if we we're not on equal footing. But we have a, one more thing to cover, and then we'll be done. So as we've seen the mystery, which I talked about, equal footing, no longer being second-class citizens. Now, there's one thing which we all have. It's a goal. Paul stated it in this passage. And it was that he wanted to present every man complete in Christ. This is the purpose of ministry. This is the purpose of my ministry. This is the purpose of your ministry. 
We proclaim Him, this starting in verse 28, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose I also labor, striving according to His power which mightily works within me. What's the point of ministry? To present every man complete in Christ. Every woman complete in Christ. We are all called to proclaim Jesus. This is why we were given spiritual gifts. And this is why the Holy Spirit dwells within us because it is not by our power that this happens, but by the power of God, as Paul makes mention. He says, for this, for this purpose I also labor, striving according to His, Jesus Christ's power, which mightily works within me. So now that we have looked at and dissected this passage, we can sum this up. We've seen what Paul was talking about regarding the apparent lack in Christ's affliction. Not that Christ's crucifixion wasn't enough, but that we are going to suffer because we're serving Christ. We looked at what it means to be a steward of a ministry because we are all given a ministry that we are all called to be stewards of. The mystery... We looked at that Gentiles now were on equal footing with the Jews. And in fact, I would say, I would add this, that to a certain degree, the Gentiles actually had a leg up because they weren't bound by all the legalism and everything that came before. And that our purpose for ministry is to present the body spotless. To present the bride washed and spotless to the groom. So with all this in mind, I'd like to conclude. As we have seen here, there is a lot to unpack in these six verses. It is my hope that as we have unpacked them, that you were able to get a greater understanding of what ministry is about. That being a minister doesn't mean that you have to be a preacher or an evangelist. Although these are part of every ministry. There's going to be times when you're going to be a preacher. There's going to be times when you're going to be an evangelist. When you share the gospel, you're an evangelist. What I'm hoping for is that each of you are better able to see yourself in ministry. Along with a greater appreciation for the resources God has given you to use in ministering to others. We can see that not everybody is gifted the same. God has blessed some with the ability to give and build wealth to use it for kingdom work. God has gifted others to preach and teach. Some are gifted musically. Some are gifted with hospitality or empathy. In any case, Scripture clearly teaches that each person is to use what God has given them to help build up the body of Christ. That is the church. Ministry comes in all shapes and sizes, from street preachers to those who visit the sick and infirm, to those who are prayer warriors and teachers. You know, I've heard it said, I've heard people say, if the only thing you can do is pray. And I think they do a disservice to those who pray. Because prayer is so effective. Prayer is so needed in ministry. So if you are a prayer warrior, I commend you. I ask that you remember me in, in your prayers. If followers of, if followers of Christ, excuse me, as followers of Christ, we have a ministry that God has given us stewardship over. That means we're in charge of. And as we have seen, God takes this very seriously, and so should we. I know the idea of doing ministry can be a scary one. Trust me, I ran from it for years. 
But remember, God doesn't expect us to do it on our own power. In fact, God knows that we can't do it on our own. That's why He gave us the Holy Spirit. That's why He gives us spiritual gifts. So that He can empower us to do what He's called us to do. God does not call the gifted. He gifts the called. He has also placed us in the body, that is, the church, the bride of Christ, so that we can partner together with one another in ministry. And I would encourage you to read Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 and, I, or excuse me, and Ephesians 4 and understand just how necess, necessary it is for the body to work together. Jeffrey, if you want to start making your way up here. As I feel bow your heads with me and um, I'll close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you. And Lord, I just want to thank you for all that you've done. Lord, I thank you for revealing the mystery that it is Christ in us. There's nothing else that we can do except ask Christ to be our Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray that you would be with those here today, that you would, if they don't know what their ministry is, Lord, that you would reveal it to them. Lord, give them a peace and a joy. And Lord, I pray that your Spirit would just be poured out upon them. Lord, I pray for your protection as we leave here today. And I thank you for all that you've done. I thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, and in His name I pray. Amen.